So in this session, we're looking at policy analysis. Now we're going to be exploring um, two main aspects. One is what is policy and the various aspects related to policy and how to do stakeholder analysis, which is a subsection of policy analysis. So let's get into things. So in the tutorial this week, what we're going to be doing is discussing policy and what it means to develop policy and how that impacts upon innovations in educational technology and in particular how it will impact upon your transformation plan and also stakeholder analysis how you analyze your stakeholders within your organization in terms of how your educational technology transformation plan will have impact upon them so there's a number of readings for this week and the main one is the UNESCO Handbook on Educational Policy Analysis and Programming. So read through this document. It goes through a range of different sections. But the first part explores the differences between policy, strategies and plans. You'll incorporate all aspects in your transformation plan. But the first aspect is what is a policy? So policy establishes the overall goals and priorities of what your organization wants to achieve. Now, the UNESCO document is written from a country level perspective, but the same concepts apply for a school or for indeed for an individual classroom. So there'll be various aspects that you need to establish in terms of what are you trying to achieve? Now, then you'll have a strategy. A strategy specifies how you go about trying to achieve that um, overall goal and then you have a plan or you have a series of plans that target particular initiatives within that strategy so your strategy may be one part of it or one part of your goals would be a strategy to improve student retention or it may be a strategy to improve their learning or their engagement with um, learning and then you'll have various plans within that one which may be to introduce an educational technology that supports their engagement with learning. So they all fit within an overall framework of trying to achieve your goals. Um, okay, and this diagram sets out the differences between them, policy, strategy, and plan, and how they relate to one another. And strategies and plans are subsets of policies, plans are subsets of strategies. So one aspect of policy development is setting out your vision. Um, this is really what you hope to achieve, what you would like your education organization to be like. And we looked at that last week in particular, looking at various models of innovation in education and what is possible to be achieved by an organization. Then generally you do an analysis of your current situation. What is the current state of your organization? How are they using technology? What is student engagement? What is their learning processes like currently? Then you'll do some planning around your implementation strategy, setting out your targets and actions and timelines of how you will see things occur. And this very much relates to your transformation plan. Then there'll be the implementation of your plan. Um, and that will often include timelines and budgets and um, assigning responsibilities to individuals and groups to achieve various things by various stages. And then throughout this process, there'll be a monitoring and review process where you'll evaluate how your transformation plan is progressing. And that can be done under various factors such as relevance, efficiency, effectiveness, impact, and sustainability. And all of these aspects are explored in more detail in the text. So just again, looking at that cycle, um, it left out step zero, which is setting the vision. But once a vision is set, it doesn't normally change that often. So the cycle tends to go cycling through um, while still maintaining the overall vision of the organization. So your strategy sets out the direction for achieving your goals and priorities and who's responsible for various aspects. Your plan identifies particular targets and outputs and provides a roadmap for um, explicit actions of what is going to be done. 
and then there'll be resources required to achieve that it may be um, ipads or um, chromebooks or software or um, certain amount of training days various other things that need to be allocated in order to achieve the plan and there'll be some time frames set out as to how long different things need to occur within okay so the document then goes on and looks at the educational context now this is looking at a national level but it again can relate to um, smaller contexts so the millennial development goals and the education for action framework provide big picture goals around transformation of global structures including education um, and these are often used to set benchmarks for goals you want to try to achieve these because this is what other countries are trying to achieve within a school you'll also have various goals maybe with competing schools nearby and within a classroom you may have various competing goals with other teachers or what, what the principal and the school leadership has set out as the overall goals for the school there'll also be various national policies around education uh, here in australia we've got a national curriculum and we've got various other policies around literacy and numeracy and various other elements then there'll be national development priorities um, again in an australian context within our national curriculum we have three main areas around sustainability engagement with asia and indigenous and Torres Strait Islander um, issues so they provide an overall priority focus within the curriculum um, that should be addressed across all learning areas then we'll have the key stakeholders and at whatever level this becomes a significant focus and you're going to be exploring this a fair bit during this course so and then from an international perspective there's also donors and aid agencies that are significant for many developing countries to address um, issues of support for these uh, major reforms and initiatives so the global priorities often have intersections they address sometimes different issues sometimes they're very similar for example the millennial development goals um, address gender and so do the ECCE goals um, education for action goals don't include things such as hunger and child mortality and maternal health because they're more focused on education um, but there's often a fair bit of overlap between these overarching goals that we're trying to achieve um, globally with our education systems and within a nation you've got various um, issues that are important so you've got social economic human and political issues and then beyond that there's various sectors that relate to that around health and infrastructure the environment industry and so forth and how education fits in with all of those becomes important particularly when we look at stakeholders because stakeholders can often be drawn from other areas other than just education so some of the key stakeholders within education are the ministries of education the, the organizations that have been set up to directly focus on education but then there's other related ministries such as uh, finance which provides money for education to be able to do their things and social service um, related ministries that provide um, support for, for parents and communities to make sure that students are um, surviving in an environment that's conducive for education uh, then there's various legislative bodies that focus on different aspects of education and civil organizations and NGOs non-government organizations um, state governments and other sort of structures um, that have a focus on education in Australia um, our states have the primary responsibility for education while the federal government has sort of an overarching uh, perspective but in other countries that's very different and then there's provincial local and district educational organizations in the united states for example the local um, community um, really determines educational priorities and focuses and goals and hiring of staff and and budgets and all the rest where the states and the federal government have much less influence um, then you've got other organizations such as parent teacher associations and teacher unions and business leaders and organizations um, 
there'll be certain key educationalists and researchers that um, have a significant influence and stakeholder um, engagement with various initiatives. And then you've got local, local community and of course students and the learners themselves having a keen interest in what may be occurring. They may not necessarily express that or be able to articulate it, but they are certainly going to be impacted by any changes. And so they should be incorporated into what's been um, explored. And then particularly for um, developing countries, donors and international development partners play a big um, role and have a, a keen say. Of course, whether or not they provide funding can often be an important factor in many of the decisions made. Okay, so in identifying the stakeholders, we then have to ensure that they are engaged with the initiative that you want to support. Now, ideally, they will have ownership and alignment with their own interests. Um, so particularly from a national level, it's best if initiatives are developed by the nation rather than by external nations. Likewise, within a school, it's best if the school or at least the school um, utilizes initiatives that they've been involved in developing. And likewise for a teacher, a teacher in a classroom, um, not taking, in, taking lesson packages that other teachers have developed, but developing your own, or at least modifying and adapting um, resources so that it fits in with your own approaches to teaching and learning, and also the school's culture and your own classroom culture, and the students' interests and culture. And there needs to be a level of harmonization because there'll always be some frictions um, where you want to use things that don't quite match, but can they still be made to work co uh, collaboratively in, an, in a harmonious way? And then there needs to be a process of accountability and managing the results of an initiative. Um, publishing the outcomes is one way, but that's not always possible within certain systems. Um, but certainly many stakeholders will want to know how things are going. If not day to day, they would certainly want to see progress reports and at least an evaluation of the success or otherwise of the program at the end of its completion. So these are again things you need to think about when you consider your stakeholders within your organization. Okay, then the document explores various ways of analyzing um, an educational organization, including the stakeholders and other aspects. So looking at access and equality issues, the quality of the education uh, being provided, how the system is being managed, be it a classroom, a school or a nation, um, the financing of what occurs, how do teachers have to buy their own uh, resources? Or is there a resource pool available? Can they go to the principal or the parent and, uh, parent and citizens association and request additional resources to be able to do initiatives um, through to national levels where they may have to request from other nations or from um, donor support organizations. And then there's a process of monitoring and evaluation in all of these aspects. So this diagram sets out a three-dimensional perspective on these various analytical dimensions, but also the learning channels being they formal, non-formal or informal, um, the educational sectors, being it tertiary, secondary, primary or um, sub-primary in terms of um, early childhood education. And then there's also um, non-institutional based education done by museums and um, uh, libraries and art galleries, but also places like zoos and holiday care programs. And then there's also aspects of homeschooling and ancillary learning that occurs outside of the formal learning processes. And then you've got cross-cutting issues that go across all of these aspects, such as gender issues, um, the aspects of teaching and teacher quality, ICT, which of course we're focusing on. Um, HIV, AIDS is a big issue in many um, countries, particularly in Africa, but we could also include their pandemics and how that impacts upon uh, various aspects and then sustainable development and other issues related to the longevity of um, programs that we wish to put into place. So lots of different aspects that relate to 
um, what's being considered in policy development. But the document goes into these in more detail, so read through that and we'll discuss that in the tutorial. A couple of little aspects that it draws out. Um, the idea of an education results chain. So you've got certain inputs, the learners coming into the schooling system, uh, how well their parents have prepared them, how well their preschooling has prepared them. Um, the input into teachers, how well the teacher education system has prepared the teachers, uh, their professional development processes and um, the selection processes for teachers to enter teacher education and training um, in terms of the quality of the teacher work, teaching workforce. And then there's also the teaching and learning materials. And we can include there much of the ICT based materials, uh, the learning management systems, the interactive um, activities and so forth that are done via technology. Then you've got various processes within the education system around the curriculum, the pedagogy of teaching, the languages of instruction being used, the size of classes, um, the number of hours being allocated for teaching. Then you've got certain outputs, how many grad students are graduating, their dropout rates. And then you've got um, outcomes, which are the skills that students are learning, their cognitive skills, their non-cognitive skills, their social skills, their ability to work with others, and then more specific um, occupational skills that they can apply into the workforce. So particularly when you're looking at a national level, these are the perspectives that are explored. Um, within our school sectors, we tend to then narrow down because we tend to focus on a particular sector. Um, but again, we still have students coming in from earlier sectors and going into later sectors. And so it all still flows through. And even in an individual teacher's classroom, you've got students coming into your class from another class at a younger year, and you're going to be preparing them to go into an older class, into another teacher's responsibility um, once they graduate from your classroom. A model for monitoring and evaluating the relevance, efficiency and effectiveness of these programs is explored in the document. And again, you're going to need to describe your evaluation process for your transformation plan. And this provides a model that you can use to explore some of those aspects. The key element is that you're not just looking at the one instance at the end of the program, at the end of your transformation plan, but there should be opportunities to uh, make modifications throughout the process of the implementation of your transformation plan. Okay, so the document also, as I said, looks at those various subsectors of education, and you can see various examples and elaborations in the document that explores how these various aspects of policy uh, development relate to these different areas and the overall themes that cut across all the different um, dimensions within the document. The one we're particularly focused on is ICT and how ICT can um, increase access to information and make learning more available to students and make it more enjoyable in many cases. But it can also improve the quality of teaching by providing greater access to resources and tools to make teaching more engaging and effective. Um, it identifies those some key issues around ICT, such as um, teacher education, ensuring that teachers know how to utilize ICT for better teaching, but also using ICT to better train teachers to make their learning more effective. Um, and then you've got aspect of developing resources through the use of ICT, particularly digital resources, and creating access to resources. And then particularly aspects around non-formal learning, where ICT and technology can allow students to access information and access learning outside of formal school-based learning, where they could learn on their own using YouTube or uh, websites and online tutorials and lots of other um, opportunities to extend their learning beyond the formal learning processes. Okay, so look at all of those different aspects. And this final one looks at the issues of collecting data and using data to inform our decision making around policy development. Um, and where we often don't have sufficient data um, throughout the whole process to make really informed decisions. 
and sometimes we have to make decisions with a lack of data. Now, schools are quite good at collecting lots of data, but there are some things that we won't have data on. We won't necessarily have a lot of data on parents um, or data on other sources of support, say, from um, industry. So there can be elements that we have to make informed decisions around or seek the data. OK, so in the tutorial, come along prepared to discuss the potential stakeholders in your education system and how they can be explored. OK, so the next, oh, and also share that on Teams. So share at least five different stakeholders that you've identified, particular for your organization. So some of the ones here, whoops, that you may not have thought about, um, your ground staff, whether or not you've got a nursing team or um, school nurse, uh, supply teachers, and how they fit into the relief teaching system, fits into things, social workers and school counselors, the school bus driver. Um, there can be a whole range of different staff that may be in stakeholders in what you're setting out to achieve with your transformation plan. Okay, so the next document looks at stakeholder analysis for educators. And it goes through um, a particular model of exploring that. So read through that. And then there's a stakeholder analysis toolkit, which sets out a more specific way of addressing things. It identifies four sectors of stakeholders related to the power or influence that they can have and the interest that they might have. And so you've got some in the lower quadrant, lower left-hand quadrant, where they might be apathetic, they're not particularly interested, and they don't really have much influence over what happens anyhow. So they're probably not ones you have to worry too much about. There may be those that are quite interested, but they don't have much power. So you might keep them informed, and they may be useful to help defend what you're doing, but they're not going to be able to achieve much. And likewise, there's going to be those with a lot of power, but aren't particularly interested. And so you want to make sure that they're kept satisfied so that they don't start becoming too interested. Um, or you may want to get them interested, but you need to be then carefully guide them in their interest. But then you've got the ones in the top right hand corner. These are ones that have got a lot of interest in what you're doing and a lot of power within the organization to determine whether or not it's going to be successful or not. So these are the ones you have to focus on and manage closely. And they're the ones that are going to promote and support your initiative. Um, so identifying your which of your stakeholders fit within which of those quadrants will help determine how much you focus on those in your transformation planning. Now, as part of that, we have what's called the saliency model. Um, and this looks at uh, the different aspects of each of these stakeholders uh, in terms of three main aspects. Um, the other one had two, two dimensions. This has three dimensions. Um, their leg legitimacy in terms of their authority to do things, the power that they have, and the urgency or their, their interest in what's happening. So we have then discretionary stakeholders, which is in the yellow region, which is around legitimacy. Um, and they have, they're not particularly uh, really interested in what's happening. And they don't necessarily have a huge amount of power, but they do have a lot of legitimacy. They've got to say responsibility for what happens. Um, so they need to be involved, but they may not necessarily want to be involved, but um, they're important that they are involved, but they're not likely to exert a lot of pressure and, and um, disrupt things too much. Then you've got what are called dormant stakeholders. Now they have a lot of power, but not necessarily an awful lot of legitimacy and nor a lot of interest or urgency. So example, parents might fall within that uh, realm. If parents start complaining and raising a fuss, they can have a huge amount of power, but they're not normally that interested in what's um, happening in terms of ICT development and, and so forth. And um, they certainly don't have an awful lot of legitimacy, but they can uh, have a lot of power. Then you've got the demanding stakeholders. These are ones that have a lot of um, a lot of interest in what's happening. They want things to go in a particular way, 
but they don't necessarily have a lot of power or um, legitimacy around that. Uh, students might often fit within that uh, field. Sometimes teachers are seen as fitting within that. Now, not everyone would think they don't have legit legitimacy, but certainly some administrators might consider that. And then you've got areas where it's intersect. Um, so where all three, um, well, so the green ones where they have uh, power and legitimacy, but not necessarily a lot of urgency. Now, these are ones where we want to make sure their expectations are being met, um, but they don't normally, uh, as long as those expectations are being met, then they're, they're happy and fine. But then you've got the dangerous stakeholders. These are ones where they have a lot of power and they're really interested. They've got that urgency, um, but they're not really that legitimate. They're not really that um, related to the project. Um, so it may be, uh, let's say the school finance manager. Now they're really interested because they, you're spending money. They've got a lot of power because they decide whether or not you get money, but they don't have a lot of knowledge about how the program, project will be successful or not. Um, but you do have to keep them on board because if they see it as not being um, appropriate anymore, they can easily withdraw their power and support. And then you have what's called dependent stakeholders. They have little interest, um, but they do have legitimate um, um, a stake, but they've also got little power. And these are often their, their students, sometimes also the teachers. Then there's a couple of other um, regions. In the very center of all three of these zones is what's called the definitive stakeholders. These have power, legitimacy, and urgency in terms of their interest in what's happening. And so they're the, probably the most important stakeholders to keep focused on and make sure that they are uh, maintaining their interest and support with what you're doing. And then you have non-stakeholders which fit outside of all of the three zones. Uh, they don't have any power, legitimacy or urgency. Okay, so just another way of defining stakeholders and talking about them in terms of your implementation plan in terms of how you're going to address their needs. Then we have a document called the Stakeholder Analysis Guidelines, which goes through and provides another framework for examining um, stakeholders. And we'll discuss that in the tutorial. And as you come along to the tutorial with a stakeholder map that you'll see framed in that document that we'll use to explore your stakeholders in more detail. And also share to teams which stakeholders you feel will be the most um, potentially offer the most opposition to the transformation you want to see happen in your organization? What are the ones that could totally derail what you want to achieve? Okay, finally, there's an optional reading because it's an entire thesis, but it does go through a process of establishing a school vision and stakeholder analysis in a huge amount of detail, as you would expect from a thesis research project. Um, but you can have a look at that if you want to explore some of these aspects in even more detail. But look at the readings um, and come along to the tutorial prepared to discuss your stakeholders, the vision that you've created from last week, and some of the policy aspects that we've been starting to explore around what you can try to achieve with your transformation plan. So that's it for this week, and I look forward to discussing this with you in the tutorial.